Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and today I'm very excited to welcome bespoke tailor Eric Jensen back into our office. Eric, hey, thank you so much for coming to Dallas. Of course, you're on your trunk show tour. Yeah, yeah. Dallas, Houston, LA. LA. And a quick jot in San Diego. And San Diego. And then we're okay. back home to New York. Then back home to New York. Yeah. Well, it's great seeing you. You know, I just got my bespoke suit uh, delivered uh, yes. after the alterations you made. Yes. Uh, I've enjoyed wearing it off the dry cleaners otherwise i'd be wearing it right now getting it freshly pressed <laughs> nice. uh, but i mean absolutely beautiful piece and again that dorme fabric it was incredible. a great cloth it was a really great cloth i think yeah. uh it, i thought it was really beautiful on the bolt but it really surprised me in fully made up i think it was just uh, yeah stunning yeah i think that that particular piece really surprised us all yeah and just how much dimensionality that dorme cloth had yeah uh, and it was one of those things that you really had to see it you know made up uh, but then also see it in a little bit different light. Exactly, yeah, because it kind of took on different personalities uh, regarding the light, whatever light it was in. Um, in my shop, it looked a lot more kind of grayish, and then when we shot it here under the lights uh, here in your in your studio, it it came out more kind of Green. greenish, yeah, which was really cool. I, mean, I've, I never knew that blue could have so many different shades. Yeah, and then there's a little <laughs> yeah. bit of blue in it. Yeah, it's like or what blue, is it? Gray. I mean, gray. It was. I don't like, know, you know what it, it was is. Like a green, gray, <laughs> blue, gray. Yeah, I mean, whatever it was. Knows. Yeah. Incredible. Comment your thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought it'd be fun to catch up. So, yeah. you know, there's no better way to catch up than uh, over a cigar. So I thought I'd invite smoking? you to join me. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorites, a Particus Aristocrat, which uh, is a little bit of a new cigar favorite of mine. Ah. If you wouldn't mind, it's... Um, What's interesting about these is it's a slightly slimmer than what is currently in vogue ring gauge. So this is a little bit over like a 30 ring gauge, yeah, okay. right? Um, nice kind of daytime smoke, real quick smoke. I mean, it's not something you need to be uh, smoking all night. Uh, and it's a November uh, 20 box date. So there we go. So we'll set those down. Yeah, this ring gauge is a it's kind of what I prefer. Yeah, similar, very similar to a Lancero. Yeah. Um, and again, beautifully rolled cigars. And yeah, great. So join me for that. Since we only have one lighter, I won't hold you up doing the classic uh, dab off of London, you know, slow light, but. Yes. I saw that video, it's fantastic. You know, it's funny, I mean, that video, the Sahakians are, I mean, talk about a class act, a consummate gentleman. Mm -hmm. And it's such a joy to film with them and to be able to share that with everyone. And it's one of my great kind of pleasures that those videos resonate so well. Yeah, well, I think it's really cool because you're kind of teaching young men, you know, things that I feel like their fathers should have taught them. Yeah. But we don't really have that kind of- I know um system anymore yeah um so certainly not in this country yeah it's certainly not so you get you get really cool things that you're able to show young men who want to aspire to be gentlemen and do things that are yeah. gentlemanly that like you know i know no one taught me how to yeah, smoke, smoke a cigar, smoke, smoke a cigar yeah, or just cigar. the ritual of smoking a mm -hmm. cigar that you know that smoking a cigar and smoking a cigarette like couldn't be more different <laughs> right so yeah everyone just lumps it all into one category of smoking yeah right? exactly but it's like not the same no not the same at all yeah. yeah yeah we had that we kind of shared that joke about how you know some of our first trousers had belt loops and yes. weren't pleated yeah yeah and how you know ultimately we arrived uh, at the, the conclusion that you know you should have pleats in your trousers and that if you're having them made you shouldn't have belt loops you should just have tabs yes but that had our fathers taught us that we would have saved a lot of uh, trouble of money mistakes yeah money mistakes yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I talk to that i always say that to my first time clients as well i say my job is to help minimize your sartorial mistakes yeah. um, because i made them so I'm hoping to help you not make yeah. them. Yeah. Well, and you've you. I mean, you do this professionally as a bespoke oh, yeah. tailor. Like you've seen, like you know, experimentations go wrong. You've seen cloth that may look good as a swatch, yes. but then made up, you know, really doesn't come together. Yeah. And it's that experience that I really feel that uh, a client should defer to his tailor on. Definitely. I, I that that idea is somewhat lost on on new clients. Because I feel like new clients um, worry about, I don't know, maybe getting taken advantage of or led down the wrong path or something like that. So this idea of trusting your tailor is something that, you know, the quicker you can learn that, I think the more um, satisfied with your product yeah. you'll, you'll be. I think it's one of the great joys of tailoring is the relationship. And I think that there needs to be a certain trust that allows uh, for 
the client in some ways, not to yield, but to just follow the intuition of a really talented bespoke tailor to lead them perhaps maybe in a direction that they weren't anticipating Definitely. or just to nudge them in certain details or in certain kind of stylistic uh, accents. Yeah, definitely. I, I will, I've got to say, not one client that I have slightly nudged towards a pleated trouser has ever been disappointed, yeah. ever regretted it. Like not one has ever said, you know, this was a really bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so yeah. Um, in fact, most of the time now that's, they mostly only get uh, yeah. pleated trousers. Yeah, well, there's yeah. a reason for it. Well, yeah. uh, well, of course I follow you on Instagram, right? And I was, have to say, very jealous of your most recent trip to Rome. Yeah. Uh, I have not traveled to the continent since COVID. Oh, right? really? So I've been to the United Kingdom twice. Yes. But I have not been, uh, shoot, I haven't been to Italy in probably five years. Oh, it's my really goodness. quite embarrassing. we got to rectify that. Uh, but I haven't <laughs> been to France since before COVID. Um, and so I just thought, you know, the last time you were here, you know, you spoke about the new uh, school yeah. that you, um, you know, this, well, it's not new, but like the new program that you set up with Sotoria Gallo in Rome to help train some apprentices for you. Yeah. And I know that you had the opportunity to go to Rome and actually visit some of those students. So I thought it'd just be fun for everyone on the channel to get a little bit of an update. How's that going? I mean, people signed up. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, well, first of all, we went because it's actually our one year anniversary of being Sartria Gallo, New York. So yeah. that merged. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so we actually, at the beginning of March was when we actually formed the, you know, the company yeah. of Sartria Gallo, New York. Yeah, I think we know. launched it on this channel. Like I we think were we did like actually. one of the ones right. to help break the news. Yeah, so you I did. feel kind of a part of that. Um, so yeah, so we did that. That was really great. It's great to be a part of and to, you know, kind of remember that kind of stepping stone in the in the history of you know Italian tailoring in the United States um, and then yeah I went out to to check on the on the two students so we had about eight applicants really uh, okay. yeah and it was it's incredible that eight people were, were actually I mean, all from that video yeah um, for the most part I mean 90% of the advertising was from that video yeah so yeah I think you you mean you reach a lot more people than I can reach on my own so mm -hmm. you know that that gave that ability to kind of reach a more of a massive amount of people um, so I had eight people you know come and, and try to see what it's like and the goal was was, you know, to put them through the same kind of life experience or uh, suffering as I went through <laughs> yeah. as, a, as an apprentice. So, you know, we didn't pay their way. Yeah. Uh, they had to figure out how to do lodging, had to figure out the visas, had to figure out, you know, life in general, living in Rome. Uh, and then they would go to the school uh, as a almost double time. So most of the time, the school is about five hours a day and they're going for eight. Oh, wow. um, so it's, it's like, an all day. Yeah, it's, it's like an pretty, all day affair for them. It's like a um, mini mester. Yeah, day, exactly. You know, summer. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is get, you know, in one year of learning enough for them to come back and be able to be beneficial to Sartria Gallo New yeah. York. And it's a full year program. Oh, yeah, it's a full year program. Well, for, full scholastic year program. Yeah. So, yeah. So they started in January and they'll finish in um, the end of July. Hmm. Yeah. Actually, beginning of August. Um, so, yeah. Wow. That seems like that's right around the corner. Yeah, well, they're moving fast, too, because they've both already made a pair of trousers, and now they're working on making coats. Wow. Um, so, yeah, and it's all under the, the tutelage. Most of the time is under Mr. Luigi Gallo, so under Master Gallo. Mm -hmm. And um, then part-time they'll be under um, Maestro Marco. And I think what we're going to do now is we're going to actually – get them to stay a couple, three more months mm -hmm. and actually work in the Sartoria in Rome so that they'll actually get that repetition yeah. of work. Um, so out of eight, two went. Yeah. So we got two. That's two great. Guys. Yeah. Yeah. And how are they doing? They're doing good. I can see the... Uh, I can see myself in them. Yeah. Uh, I can see their kind of the difficulties with the language barrier. Yeah. Um, the difficulties with the the math the, the way that the Italian life is, which is completely <laughs> different than the American life. And what how what's that like? Yeah, I mean, there's just a lot less. Um, it, there's a lot less. So, like in in America, you know, if you went to a school, you'd get like your syllabus. And, you know, at the beginning of the year, you get your syllabus and this is like exactly what you do throughout the year. And this is we stay stick to that. There's kind of a rigidity to it. You know, when your finals mm -hmm. are, your tests are. And in, and in Italy, they're kind of, yeah, I mean, like this is what we're going to do. But, you know, we might we'll might do there do and we'll go there and we'll go there. But we'll get we'll get to the end product. It's just not going to be, yeah. you know, the way that 
we mapped it out yeah. in the beginning kind of thing. So you got to go with the flow a little bit. Yeah, so you, you got to trust able, the process. Trust the process, exactly. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, it's good and it's good. It's, it's a way for them to learn, you know, kind of to be adaptive and to be yeah. kind of fluid in, in the way in which they're thinking. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're doing good. I can see, like I said, I can see myself in them. I can see, I talked to them about, you know, their experience there and they said, um, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe I'm in Italy doing this. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I was the same way. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling. Yeah. Um, well, that's great. Well, what else? I mean, what else were you doing over there? I mean, tell me. Yeah, so... You know, let me live vicariously. <laughs> the, the majority of it was business stuff. So working just alongside Marco and, and Maestro Gallo, um, planning for, you know, our future, where we want to grow the business, mm -hmm. how we want to, you know, kind of um, get better at things. So, you know, in, in terms of our, our workmanship, not our workmanship, but our time frame. Yeah. Um, so we talked about, you know, what we need to do to accomplish that. Right now we have two main coat makers and two trouser makers, and then we have two uh, kind of finisher apprentices mm -hmm. who are kind of doing finishing work and basting and stuff like that. So, like, how can we best utilize those people? Do yeah. we need more people? Stuff like that. Yeah. And then other than that, you know, Marco and I just worked really hand in hand together on, um, you know, certain products and certain um, uh, projects that we're, yeah. we're working on right now. Any exciting kind of new projects or new yeah, kind so of styles that you can not, not fully, tease us with? But, not uh, fully, but, you know, we're kind of looking at ways where we can show what we can do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because a, a lot of people think when they, when they think of a bespoke tailor that it's a suit and or some variants of a suit so sport coat trousers or suit with trousers stuff like that and you don't realize all the myriads of things that you can kind of do um, with a bespoke tailor because anything that we can make out of cotton or wool we can make anything yeah. you can you can think of we can make mm -hmm. so but a lot of people are limited in their ideas yeah. because we don't design anything. We just, you know, you Make, design yeah, it. Yeah. So, you know. That's kind of the challenge with, like, we can do anything mm -hmm. is that, like, well, the scope is so wide that where, you where know, do we start? you're limited by your imagination of, it, like, well. Yeah. Which is, you know, again, the great value of a good bespoke tailor is to guide one along in that process. Whereas if you walk into a store, it's like what you see is what you get. What you get, like, yeah. What's on the shelf, like what's on, you know, the rack is... Yeah. what's available and that's it but the, and, and the good thing about that for the client is they can see it mm -hmm. so they can go oh i didn't know that i wanted that but i want it but for a bespoke tailor it's uh, i don't know that i didn't want that and i can't see it so how am i gonna come yeah. up with it mm -hmm. you know so we're trying to figure out a way in which maybe we can start making some one-off pieces to show in the sartoria yeah. or maybe in a way in which bringing some semblance of a fashion show or something like that yeah so it's kind of been things that we've kind of been thinking up because you know Marco was talking about how he has a, a, a cloth maker who can um, you know make cloth that actually has down down uh, in it, down feathers yeah. in in it for the lining mm -hmm. so then all the things that you can do with that like you could line a coat with it you can line a trench with it you can do different items and stuff like that and I told Marco I said yeah but the best thing you know what we need to do is figure out a way in which we can show that to a yeah. client and so that they can figure out yeah. this is what we can do. But there's a lot of exciting I mean you know fabric I mean of course these fabric mills have been around for generations right mm -hmm. Uh, and so there's a tremendous amount of tradition that goes in heritage that kind of goes into the cloth. Yeah. But weaving, and we had the opportunity to visit Lovett Mill whenever we were in Scotland. Which is a beautiful You mill. know, weaving is, in fact, highly technologically, like, advanced, yeah. right? I mean, you've got these highly technical looms that are doing the weaving now. Now, they're weaving it the same way it's been woven, but it's a better, more consistent product. Yeah. But you also see more treatments to the cloth now, allowing for, you know, Again, kind of juxtaposing a very traditional 100% wool cloth, but with maybe some type of wash or coating that, again, allows it to still be natural, but then also become waterproof. Waterproof, yeah, and things like that. Yeah, and there's so many aspects of that. And then there's so many different wide ranges of cloth that uses that or doesn't use that. Or even in your ranges of cloth, like you even get things like whip cords or mohairs or, yeah. you know, and then your super numbers and things like that. And now, you know, really cool things are happening like, um, you know, slowly in, uh, putting in a little bit of um, cashmere into a weave, not making it so that it can. So like, you know, most of the time when you're when you think of a cashmere, 
cloth. You're not going to wear it as a trouser. Mm -hmm. But people like Harrison's are using a good amount of wool with a touch of, of cashmere to it. So you get that really soft kind of luxury Finish. feel of the cashmere, but the body and the weight of, yeah. of, of, of wool that gives you that longevity and that strength behind it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, there's, there's so many things that are going on within the cloth world and then so many things that are going on within the tailoring world. And, you know, first time clients don't, don't think this way and you shouldn't because you need to build your You're wardrobe. You're wearing a great first time client suit right there. Yeah, perfect first time <laughs> client suit. Yeah, and it is, but it's a completely different cloth yeah. than, you know, mo what you'd find off the rack. But once you start building that cornerstone of your yep. of your uh, wardrobe, then you can start expanding really branching out. and branching out. But but you need to know where to go to branch yeah. out. And yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great element of the longevity, or great benefit of the longevity of one's relationship with their tailor, and that. You know, I think that, you know, like the hashtag menswear, you know, like Instagrammers and everything, you see a degree of voyeurism where, you know, they are going, they want to go to everyone, yeah. right? But by going to everyone once, you really go to no one ever, Out of ever. you know? Yes. And so, you know, okay, try a few people out, you know, date around a little bit, you know, to kind of see who you, you know, who you have chemistry with, like, you know, who's cut and kind of personality you get along with. But once you do that, right, and kind of survey the available options, you know, really kind of settling on one primary tailor, Definitely. right, you know, that you're able to build a long-term relationship with because it allows you to build these foundations, Yeah. right, but then once that foundation is built and you've got a really solid relationship, it allows you to really begin to experiment with, you know, the more seasonal costs or the slightly bolder or different cuts. And that's where I feel like it really becomes fun. Exactly, and it becomes yours as well because you can put your stamp on it. The other thing about that is your first suit with a tailor is gonna be probably better than anything else you've had, but it's not gonna be as great as it could be. Yeah, It's always gonna be greater after your third, second, third, fourth, yeah. fourth suit. Which is a little bit of a paradox, right? Because again, you know, you've got to commit to the process. And mm -hmm. it's not to say that that first one isn't great or perfect because yeah. it is, but there is an evolution to that process that allows it to become even better. Even better, because every time that I fit you, I adjust your pattern. Yeah. And every and then I adjust it a little more and a little more. And even when I'm done and I finish it and we're, we're done with the, with the suit and I see it on you and maybe you might wear it back to the tailor shop on your next commission and I'll look at it while it's on you still. And then I'll, I'll say, you know, what we could have done better is yeah. we could have just shifted that balance a little better. Well, you know what we could have done better is we could have made that lapel just a little more X, Y, or Z. You know, things like that. And then and in that, I'm adjusting your pattern. If you never come back, I've yeah. adjusted your pattern. And, and, never. You, and, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you've, you've, you've wasted that opportunity. Yeah. You know, and, and, and so if you do come back and I've adjusted your pattern, then you've, you've, we've already started at like a firm foundation as opposed to starting with no foundation. Yeah. So you're going to, you're going to end up with a better, better suit and better yeah. quality. And yeah. also because your tailor, if he's worth anything, wants to do better mm -hmm. than the last time. Cause he's always thinking I can do better. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know about yours, but mine's is uh, really beginning to warm up, which is one of the great hallmarks of good cigars that, you know, kind of needs to warm up a little bit and yeah. then it mellows and smooths. Yeah, and gets cleaner yeah, and you can cl taste yeah. kind of those yeah. those better notes. So tell me, I mean, you know, you're in Rome, I mean, you're visiting with, uh, you know, uh, the maestro, you know, the gallows. I mean, what's it like? I mean, you know, any great dinners? I mean, <laughs> what were some of the hallmarks of the trip? Well, help us, you uh, know, uh, share so with us. <laughs> the, here's the thing about Rome. Um, the, the, well, first of all, there's many, there's myriads of things. Uh, I won't give away all my secrets because I feel like you have to kind of be initiated into Rome okay. before you can you can fully experience and, and love it. Um, a lot of people, I think Rome is a city where you either love it or you hate it. Um, because to me, it's the most most authentic Italian city. One of the most authentic t Italian cities. I think I'll probably get a lot of crap on that in the comments yeah. right now. But well, let us you know, know what you think about that in the comments below. That. <laughs> <laughs> but it's. Uh, I feel like you know Florence has this really beauty, this uh, this incredible beauty to it. Yeah. But it feels almost fake to me. Yeah. Um, because it just feels almost like Disneyland. Like it's not quite. And Rome just feels really raw and like quintessential yeah. Italian and it's not as crazy as Napoli can get yeah so it's kind of like that happening I mean, whenever year. I'm in Naples I feel like I'm in a third world. yeah exactly <laughs> exactly something's always on fire when yeah. I'm in Naples um so yeah and then the the Roman idea of of eating is this um 
five sixths kind of idea. So Rome used Rome used to be kind of more of a uh, a poor city, mm -hmm. and so the it people, was a big city. It's a huge city, yeah. and so and it had a lot of poor population. Like you had the very rich, but you had a lot of a poor population. Yeah. So they learned to cook with the parts that were discarded. Um, and so you have this this idea of slow cooking and really bringing out the essences of the meat and the, and, the, mm -hmm. and you know what whatever they're cooking with, so that kind of ideology is there. So you have you have dishes like a machachana and carbonara, which are you know like a machachana is made with che pig cheek fat, and it's a tomato sauce that's made with that, and you kind of render yeah. down the pig cheek Here. fat. Get me even that out for me. Problem. I'm getting you talk too much. You're not, yeah, I can't even. Yeah. I can't enjoy anything. Um, so, anyways, um, so when you go to Rome, you kind of want to look for those kind of dishes and stuff. Mm -hmm. The other thing about eating in Rome, it's actually much cheaper than one would think. So, if you find anywhere that's got really expensive things on the on the menu, it's usually more of a tourist trap. Yeah. So you want to find places where like your your pastas run around nine, ten euro, something like that. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, but one of the greatest things that we got to do was we got to go to the uh, Gallo's Villa, which mm -hmm. is outside of Rome, and we had kind of a big kind of family feast with them, and, and um, Mr. Gallo's wife cooked us all an incredible meal. And, <laughs> yeah, that was just one of those things. I don't, yeah. I, not very they many people. They rolled you out. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, like, yeah, make up feeding like, Can us. I walk home, please? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to need to walk like the miles home <laughs> yeah. to, to burn this off. But yeah, that was a really great experience. Just to even be able to go to bed at night. Yeah, <laughs> to be able to like roll over on your yeah. belly. <laughs> So yeah, that was a really great experience. But yeah, um, you know, I think at, at one point I think it'd be really cool for us to be able to kind of give uh, kind of a uh, tour to the Gallo Sartoria in Rome yeah. to our clients and kind of do kind of a Roman yeah. kind of thing with them. Which would be we'd really love fun. to go. Yeah, we'll, we'll take you. Support us on our Patreon yeah. <laughs> page. Um, and one of the things I think that's got to be really magical is that of course you've got bespoke tailors in New York, but you guys are really an extension of Satoria Gallo in Rome, which has an incredible history and heritage to it. You know, all of the garments that you're making, you know, are cut, of course, in New York by you. Yes. Um, it's fully bespoke, right? I mean, like you are the bespoke tailor and you're the only one that's dealing with the client, but it's being sent back to this um, Sartoria in Rome that has an incredible history. To yeah, incredible history. I mean, our co-maker, Carlo, He's been working since he was 12 years old. Yeah, so crazy. yeah, it's crazy. And he he makes some of the most beautiful garments, um, you know, that I've that I've ever seen. Um, just his attention to detail and the way in which he moves and works with the cloth, the way that he puts sets a collar is just gorgeous yeah. to me. And so you have this rich tradition that was barely even being tapped into by Americans because the Gallows didn't travel very often. Yeah. Well, I can't think of any Roman tailors that travel. No. Right? So unless you are traveling to Rome mm -hmm. to have your pieces made, you know, it's not like the London tailors, right? Which of all of the, uh, you know, different genres of tailoring, you know, the, the British, the French, or the Italian. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get the Neapolitan tailors that have traveled yes. kind of, you know, off and on, but never very consistent, yeah. right? Part no, of the yeah. problem, no. yes. you know, <laughs> very Neapolitan. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I mean, the Milanese, the Romans, I, I mean, you just don't see that here. No, we don't get, you don't get it much here. In the at US. all. Yeah, yeah, at all. I mean, yeah, I don't want to say like finitely, like yeah. at all. It's not an absolute. Yeah, an absolute, because yeah, I'm sure someone's going to say, well, actually, you know, so-and-so travels here. But um, I think to have that presence within the United States and to be able to not just like, we're not just saying, oh, we're Italian suits. Yeah. We're actually legitimately made bespoke Italian suits made in a tradition spanning 60 years. Yeah. So. Well, and the suit has all of the provenance of the same suit that one would be one would have if they went to actually Gallo in Rome. Exactly. Right. It's yep. made by the same people made on the, the same, same benches, yeah. you know, with the same thread, yep. with the same techniques. Same right? ever, yeah. And even yeah, and even the way that I cut is the same way that we, they that Marco and Luigi cuts in in Rome and the same way that we draft our patterns the exact same yep. way. And is all the work done on premises yeah. the same way that it would be say done in Savile Row? Yeah, so we have um, in Rome, we have our um, flagship uh, Sartoria, which is there. And basically, um, there's a downstairs, which is where the clients will be and where there's cloth and cloth books and stuff like that and where the fittings happen. And then right above that on a mezzanine level is where Marco cuts. So that's where his cutting table is and where he cuts all the cloth, drafts mm -hmm. all the patterns for the Italian clients. 
And then basically next door and upstairs is where our tailors are. Yeah. Um, and so that's where Carlo works. That's where our two uh, um, mm -hmm. our finishers work. Our trouser makers, like most, are off site because mm -hmm. I don't know why. Ever since the dawn of time, trouser makers were like, we're not working in the tailor shop, we're working off site. Yeah. So our trouser makers work from home. It's two mm -hmm. ladies. Um, yeah, and then other than that, and then our other coat makers there as well. Yeah, in the in the Sartoria. Yeah, that's which is, great. Yeah, it's really great, and it's really cool to see. And it's, it was fun for me to be able to go and see. And you know, well, when we went right after COVID, kind of let us back in, which was um, about six months ago. Okay, I was so able to meet 20, all the twenty-one. Yeah. yeah, because when I when we first merged, I was I couldn't go to Italy because yeah. COVID, Italy was shut down, so I didn't get to meet our tailors and everything, get to get to know them. So last time and this time, I was actually able to get to know them and work alongside them a little more, yeah. and you know, see their process and yeah. methodology. So yeah, yeah. So it's really cool. It's a really, it's a really great experience. It's a really cool thing to be able to provide to American clients and to yeah. have that um, place that's actually always there in the U.S. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting because you know, New York, of course, you do have great tailors, right? I mean, it's probably the only city in the United States that can lay that claim. Yes, uh, but. You know, you don't see the Italian genre represented at all, no. right? I mean, you've got people that have trained uh, in Britain, you yeah. know, that are of the Savile Row tradition. Yeah. Um, you've got huntsmen that's sending their work to Savile Row to be done in yeah. a really pure, bespoke manner. Um, you know, there's really no Parisian representation other than maybe Cifanelli traveling. Traveling, um, yeah. But I think he's the only of the Parisian tailors that really travels to yeah, New York. I don't think. Uh, and then, you know, you've got traveling Italian tailors that I'm sure frequent the city, but you don't have anyone that's based there. No. Right. And so you are, you know, really kind of cutting edge uh, in many ways of being, uh, having a full time presence in New York to extend that degree of service to America that, you know, was otherwise just not available. Not available. Yeah. And, and it's also great that I am an American trained in Rome. So I, I understand the American clientele, I think, better than an Italian would understand yeah. the American clientele. Yeah. So you're able to, to give that kind of um, level service and that kind of equal playing field between the t between tailor and client. Yeah. You know, and, and that conversation kind of makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah, well, great. Well, yeah. congratulations on that. And, you know, again, the suit uh, is amazing. I love it. Fantastic. I, like, it's such a privilege to, to have actually a suit. And it was an interesting kind of step forward kind of in our relationship because the first piece you made completely yes. yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> and this piece, you know, I mean, as, as a, a, opposed to just having the influence of you being trained in Rome, right? Yes. Now it is, you know, your Roman training as a cutter, but actually being made in Rome. Yes, exactly. And so it's uh, it's 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 kind of a piece that that fits that fits that. You know, your first one was cut by the same pattern that you know the gallows used, but made by me, so with a little bit of a different expression to it. Yeah. But this one has that fully Roman kind of touch to yeah. it, and and I think it it plays really well in yeah, that. Yeah, the that. providence. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So now it's. Well, we need to talk about I was the next. Say, piece. We need to do yes. another one. <laughs> well, we've got a few fabrics here that uh, I thought that I would I would show you, yes. right? Uh, and it's, I guess, maybe slightly the other way around in that this bolt was a gift from a good friend of ours, yes, Zach. Zach from Dormier. From which Dormier, is gorgeous which cloth. is Dormier cloth, which does some amazing stuff. But this was actually uh, underneath it an interesting, let's fold that in half maybe. So this is an interesting tweed cloth from Lovett Mill. Yes which I actually inherited from a good friend of ours, unfortunately, that uh, that passed. And so this was something that he had acquired from the London Lounge, but hadn't had an opportunity to have made up. And he was very nice to kind of leave that to me. So a very special sentimental piece. Uh, and it's from Love It, which we actually had the opportunity of visiting in Scotland at Hoyk oh. um, and filmed an actual tour of the mill. That That's a really cool piece. I think... Well, I I think it's an incredible piece because there's a history behind it for you. And so it makes it a little more sentimental. Yeah. Um, I think then also knowing that history in the background of the Lovat Mill, which Lovat makes incredible tweed. If you, know, if you haven't had the ability to wear Lovat tweed before, um, I highly recommend it. They make stunning tweeds. Um, I have a couple of their books, but this from London Lounge is one, these are one-offs basically. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, small runs, Yeah. exclusive. 
I mean, I don't even think the London Lounge will let me in because like I'm in the industry or something. So it's like <laughs> truly a club. Yes, it is. So it's my one opportunity to get a London Lounge piece. Uh, and so I kind of wanted to see what you thought of these. I mean, these are two very different cloths. I mean, this is in some ways similar to the previous yes. piece, the most recent one you made, and mm -hmm. that this is a, a business city suit. Yes, it is. Right? I mean, With a little a, more play to it. A little bit more play, but it's worsted. Yes. Right? And then this is literally the polar opposite of that. Completely. It is a tweed, yeah. you know, woven in Scotland. Yeah. Um, and most people would think, not like, oh, should I get a tweed from an Italian tailor? You know, should I? Is that something they'd feel comfortable working with? Yeah. Um, to me, I think it's kind of really cool to do because you get the juxtaposition of cloth and the heaviness of the cloth and the softness of the tailoring. Mm -hmm. um, so it almost it almost lends itself to each other better because um, you're not we're not adding more weight to something that's already heavy enough. So you get that soft feeling of it yeah. with the the cloth gives you that structure that you kind of want from from a tweed. Yeah. Um, I think this would be fun to work with if you would allow me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I think it would be a really great sport coat, and I think we could design it. One of the it. few people I trust with it. No, the, I, <laughs> I feel honored. I, I I always feel very honored when a client lets me work on something that they have mm -hmm. already bought or that they have that they have a cherishness to, um, because I think that's a it's an honor to be a part of that, you know, building of the cloth. Yeah. I think then we can design it really well together as we maybe after when we do the first fitting, we can talk about how we want this, the pockets to yeah. go and things like that. So I thought it would be fun, maybe if you would allow us to, yeah. uh, in this video, maybe to talk a little bit about how you would initially kind of approach these two fabrics. This, of course, is a suit. This is not a jacket. Maybe we can select a pair of trousers to go with that. Definitely. Yeah. So in this guy in the suit, um, First of all, the the weave on this is fantastic. You have a little bit of a of a grain to it, so it kind of has a little bit of interest as well. Visual texture. Yeah, visual texture. This is um, which one is this? This is their Amadeus, which is a great kind of um, perfect business suit um, cloth. Yeah. Um, I think this is a little different than anything you probably have. I don't have anything like that. Yeah, no. which would be really cool. Um, I I almost think it'd be really fun to do in a double breasted. If there's cloth, yeah. Um, the only thing that you would have to think about is if you would be okay with having that much of this pattern, because there there is a bit of a pattern to it. I think so. I mean, I enjoy. You know, I have to say, I mean, I really enjoy double-breasted garments. You've not cut anything no, double-breasted yeah. for me, so it'd be fun to kind of see that, yeah. right, and see how that manifests differently. And I'd keep it. I mean, a double-breasted maybe is an interesting way to dress this up. Exactly. Right. Yeah. While still keeping it pretty formal. And you know, without trying to do anything like, oh yeah, you know, pink lapels on a single-breasted suit. <laughs> you know. I was waiting for you to say something about that. <laughs> um, I have to tell you, I'm, which looks great, but uh, I'm not there yet. Hey, so. we're fine. We'll, we'll, then we'll just pink lapel and double-breast it, and then you'll be happy as a clam. Uh, yeah, I just feel like that would just add um, a little bit of interest to the suit without being ostentatious or being outrageous in any direction. Because yeah. I feel like if you just notch lapel this and flap on the yeah. pockets, it can almost become almost one dimensional. Well, it could look like it's something, you know, off the rack. Yeah, and so if nice. you just put, if you can add that one little dimension to it that makes someone go, oh, yeah. you know. So you cut high-waisted for trousers, just like the last pair. Definitely. An interesting question on this one, would you cuff the trousers? Cuff, yeah, I kind of was thinking the same thing. Yeah. A cuff, okay. I mean, yeah. yeah. I was thinking the same thing. I didn't want to broach. I didn't want to broach the subject and get turned down. Yeah. So I was kind of. So why would you cuff the them? Just to help me understand. Uh, I would cuff them just because, I, just to add that little extra layer of of interest to it. And yeah. it's not. I also feel, a lot of times people think that cuffs um, are are formal, and I find them to be informal. Yeah, slightly informal. Slightly actually. informal. So I feel like if you do the double-breasted, with which formalizes it, and then the cuff, which kind of keeps it, brings it back down to the informality, you kind of keep a nice even even keel on, on the yeah. suit. Um, it's interesting. I'm just going to throw this out there. I was actually leading to uncuffed, so it's very interesting. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, is, it is something that we can, we can talk about more. Yeah. I think that when I cut it, I'll probably leave the extra cloth yeah. for the cuff. 
and you can decide over time. That's that's the other thing that I always tell my clients is we're not married to anything. I mean, we're married to most things. Like if yeah. I cut a double breast, it's got to be a double breasted. Yeah. But like, you know, if you're on the fence on pleats and I cut it with pleats and you're like, oh, I hate pleats, then I can take them out. I can't add them. Yeah. Cuffs are the same. same yeah. Line. So, well, that's interesting. I'm going to have to refer back to the point I was making earlier, which is entrusting in the intuition <laughs> of your tailor. So I'm going to go with you on this one. Fantastic. Um, so, okay, well, that's great. This is an absolutely beautiful navy cloth. Yeah, I think it's a really beautiful navy and cloth. And Dorme is just an, I mean, a great bill. I mean, they really yeah. do next level stuff. I mean, oh, it, yeah. it is a multi-dimensional fabric that always has so much depth and detail to yes. it. Like there's more than what meets the eye initially. Which is a, always a great thing about yeah. cloth. Especially yeah. when you get up close to it and then and then you can see like, oh, those little details. But from far away, it's, it's, un, it's unassuming. So. Yeah, and it is a slightly more expensive cloth, right? Yeah. But with that, you get so much. You get, yeah, you get a lot of. There's a lot that goes into the quality of the cloth, and the makeup of the cloth, and the in the in the refining of the cloth, and even in the dyeing. I think these are, if I remember, I think yarn dyed. Right? Yeah, yarn dyed. Yeah. So. Well, great. Well, let's maybe set this one aside, right? Um, I guess I'll send that back with you. And then you know this cloth from Lovett. Um, I mean, goodness, I mean, pick this up so that we can yeah. see, you know, see it here kind of on camera. I mean, you know, what I love about this is it is, I mean, just the earth tones of the browns are gorgeous. They're gorgeous. But then you have this incredible blue yep. that kind of shines through that really jumps, but isn't, I mean, it, it has a, a softness to yeah. it, right? I mean, there's a real elegance to the way that that blue kind of overcheck exactly. comes out. The reason why is because if you can see in the backgrounds of the brown, the blue is actually in that. So you can actually see speckles yeah. of the actual blue in the background of the browns, yeah. which kind of makes it so that it's not as wild that yeah. they introduce this blue overcheck. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things we had the opportunity to do whenever we were at Lovett is to sit down with their designer, right? And so she was showing us the, you know, basically the raw fiber, the dyed fibers, right? Yeah. Before it is spun into a yarn. Oh, wow. Right? And so in one of these strands of yarn, I mean, there could be eight, 10 different colors that go into that, oh, that mix. And so the way that they blend the color to create that dimensionality to it is really just something that I think before seeing it, I couldn't really comprehend or appreciate. Yeah. That and that's an incredible thing to me is to see how that designer could see those colors and and twist them together in a way where it became a cohesive piece and not thing yeah. that was too, you know, like what what why did you put that there? Yeah. You know, but it all just kind of sings. And I think this cloth everything sings very harmoniously together. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think this would be a beautiful just a good, you know, weekender or kind of um, uh, soft, uh, easy to wear kind of yeah. sport coat. Would you do it with patch pockets? And so that's the question that, that I think that would be fun to think about. You, um, it would be really cool to do with patch pockets. It might be cool to do with a frog mouth. Yeah. Um, or, or, um, what's a frog mouth? It's kind of the pocket kind of is U shaped almost. Okay. Um, just has a little bit of a, you see it a lot on kind of, um, on kind of Southern wear, like uh, Texas wear or even, you know, yeah. things like that where the, where the mouth kind of has a little bit of a, yeah. where the pocket has a little bit of a mouth to yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which might be kind of cool to do, um, to see. Uh, it'd be something that I'd want to, you know, kind of draw pictures yeah. of and, and kind of get inspiration of. Yeah. Um, if not, I think a patch pocket would go great. Uh, be, but I think, I almost want to give this something more than that. Yeah. You know, like I feel like a, a sport coat in this with a patch pocket is like, yeah, you know, but it's kind of like, duh, yeah. you know, and I want to <laughs> see if we can find a way where we can just give it, I, I feel like I want to give this cloth the due that it's deserved. Yeah. And so I want to find a way that we can maybe do yeah. that with it without yeah. going, you know, without being, doing something stupid. Yeah. You know? Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what about uh, odd trousers? So uh, how would you, what would you What's the perfect dot trouser for something like this? Uh, I would do a whip cord or, um, or a cavalry twill. So something a little bit heavier. Something a little heavier. Yeah. So what you want to do is you want to play to the, the strengths of the cloth. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to put, you want to put light pieces with heavy pieces. Yeah. You don't want to put like, um, 
you know, really fine, like that dormier cloth with something that's got a rough hand to it. You know, you kind of want to keep everything together. So I feel like a cavalry twill or even a whip cord will kind of, it keeps the texture that this needs and mm -hmm. then give it the, the, the body that the trousers need yeah. as well. And I mean, gray in your trouser kind of. Um, well, this has, again, so many different so colors many, worked into it. It's got yeah. a little bit of gray, it's got the brown. Browns, yeah. I mean, it even has blue, you could work a navy. Yep. You could work in navy, you could work in um, even a softer blue, you could work in an oatmeal. Um, you have so many options to go through. I think an oatmeal would look beautiful with this. Okay. But I, I have a couple swatches at the back of the Sartoria. I wish I brought them with me so yeah. I could show them. But I've got a couple that I want to go through and I'll, and I'll pair with it. Do you have any swatches kind of here today that maybe we could just look at for fun? I might. So I got two books that might work. I kind of need to see how they go together. Mm -hmm. But at least they'll give us maybe hopefully a color palette to work off of. Okay. Um, so first one is Holland and Sherry's Classic Worsteds. Um, what's great about these is they have a good body and strength to them. They're very, very English in their, in their feeling. Um, so they, they would play well with this. It's just, I don't know how well they'll play. Um, and if I, mean, I this brown one, I was going to say that was, <laughs> that was the first one I pulled right. up to. Yeah. This brown, I think would play really well off of the darker colors, um, of this cloth. Uh, it also has this, the body to it, so it's, um, I would imagine, yeah, this is about a 13 ounce. Okay. So it's got, it's probably in the realm of this. This is probably what, like 15, 16 ounce? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. If I know Lovat, their heavier weights are probably yeah. around 16, 17 ounce. So you're in that same realm. Um, so I think that would be a really great color. I would almost want to go more oatmeal in than this, but I okay. think that would be a good option. Yeah, and see, this is interesting because again, this kind of oatmeal over check yeah. then is pulled out with that. It's pulled out with that. You could even, if you were feeling so, you could go with a soft blue like that, which would pull out that blues as well. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what's fun with the great eye jacket, having a bunch of color, good texture. Yeah. Is those are three great, you know, color palettes right there that all work with this jacket. All work perfectly with that jacket. And, and then you've got, you've almost got three suits yeah. For the price of one suit and two odd trousers. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And so that I think would be fantastic. Yeah. Fox um, Air, it's a little bit lighter in weight, but it's got the texture that I like for this. And if that didn't have an overcheck, that would be really nice. But yeah. even in, in that kind of brown, yeah. would be fantastic. Same idea. M my thing is I'd like to take these colors and, and add a whip cord to it. Okay. Just to give it just to make it really look like it's an odd trouser. Yeah. Um, and, and especially as like one of the piece, or if we made that as one complete mm -hmm. uh, piece, then later on you could add other things like these as well. But just in my vision, if I had my perfect life, I'd do it with a whip yeah. or, or a Calvary 12. Yeah, that's exciting. So we'll yeah. have to send these back to you. Yeah. Or ship them up. Or ship them up to me. Yeah, I don't have room in, the, yeah. in my suitcase. But uh, yeah, sh we'll ship them up to me. And we'll, and we'll get to work on it. And then, you know, hopefully get this done by the time you can wear it in, in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> you guys go. even have winters. Well, we, occasionally, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, and that's one of the other things about kind of the bespoke process. You're always looking, working a little bit ahead. Yes, always work ahead. Yeah. Don't don't come to your tailor now for your summer. Yeah, too yeah. late. You missed the boat. You missed the boat. Right, and then yeah. by the time the next summer comes around, yeah. you know, who knows how Who knows how you'll feel. Much, yeah. yeah, but you'll get your, your piece right at the end of the season and you'll go, man, I really wish I could wear that, but you can't. <laughs> yeah. Well, great. Well, Eric, hey, it's always a pleasure. And, uh, you know, we could sit here and chat, oh, know. you know, as, indefinitely. As long as they'll let us. You know, as long <laughs> as, uh, you know, we have film to roll. But um, anyway, well, good. It's exciting to work on this again. Yeah. And, you know, the other piece is just fantastic. Yeah. So we've got the unboxing video that everyone can take a look at. Uh, but otherwise, I look forward to getting started on these new projects. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Kirby, for sharing a cigar with me. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, there we have it. Eric Jensen, Sartoria Gallo. Uh, always a pleasure to have him in the office, in the studio here in Dallas. Uh, and again, you know, that relationship that one has with their bespoke tailor only gets better with time and the more kind of pieces and commissions you put uh, into that relationship. And I couldn't be uh, more excited and more privileged to have him work on these items. Of course, if you want to learn more about Satoria Gallo, best way is probably to check out their Instagram. 
And if you're interested in having Eric commission anything, of course, reach out to him. Uh, as we spoke about, he does travel and is available for appointments in New York. They've got a beautiful location uh, up on the Upper East Side, and they'd be more than happy to welcome you in there. Of course, um, if you haven't visited KirbyAllison.com, please take a moment to do so. Uh, it's the best way to support this channel and the work that we do here. Uh, there you'll find the largest collection of luxury garment care and luxury shoe care accessories anywhere in the world, as well as other great clothing accessories like this beautiful sovereign grade jack card tie I'm wearing, pocket square socks, uh, braces, uh, and so much more. Uh, so take a look at KirbyAllison.com. Uh, and a new way to support this channel is we just launched a Patreon. Uh, it's a way to support the content that we're filming. 100% of the proceeds from that Patreon will uh, be used to support our ability to travel to places like Rome uh, to visit uh, Eric and so many other great independent artisans and craftspeople. And so that's an exciting new thing that we have on this channel. There are some exciting benefits uh, in the Patreon, discounts on the website, uh, different exclusive content that we'll be releasing, releasing just our Patreon uh, members, uh, and also some club ties and some other things that we look forward to kind of sourcing uh, as we travel, so check that out. Uh, otherwise, I'm Kirby Allison, and I love to help the well-dressed acquire and care for the wardrobes while exploring the world of quality craftsmanship and tradition. Thanks for watching. <laughs>